I first saw Little Nightmares at EGX Resed, one of the few gaming conventions I would actually venture outside of my house to go and see. <laughs> its particular focus is on indie games, and compared to the regular EGX and bigger gaming conventions here in the UK, there are significantly less people attending, and more specifically less queues, which in turn leads to more time to actually play the games on show, which is why I'm there. And that's when I came across this creepy little exploratory puzzle platformer called Little Nightmares. And for sure it wasn't something I'd soon forget. Except I did, because it took me a good few years since then before I actually played the game in full for myself. And by that time the game had already become incredibly popular. That popularity was in large part due to the disgustingly creepy designs of the antagonists of this strange world in which you explore. It is full on nightmare fuel with the teacher from the sequel being for me personally the most terrifying out of the, the two games. But only mentioning the designs of the antagonists would be doing the franchise a disservice. I could mention the incredible sound design that gives the world its eerie tone. Come here and get your prize! the nifty platforming puzzles and straight up terror that you feel during the chase scenes. And as much as I enjoy the game and I recommend anyone who hasn't played Little Nightmares 1 or 2 to go and get it because it's pretty cheap, that's not why I made this video. We're here to try and understand this game and the world in which we play. And normally, having played through both of the games, read the comics and lived on the wiki for some time now, this video's taken a while, I would normally be able to start off these videos and break down usually chronologically what is happening in the games, why it's happening and try to understand it, hence the understanding the game series title. However Little Nightmares actively leaves open so much of its lore and reasoning to the interpretation of the player that no one theory will ever be proven right. But I guess that's kind of the point of theories. Especially given the developers Tarsia Studios are no longer working on the Little Nightmares IP anymore unless Bandai Namco chose to continue the series as has been reported. In any case, let's try and deduce a timeline of events based purely on the two games and the mobile game Very Little Nightmares and go from there. Let's start this off by reading a quote from a Q&A of Mervic, one of the devs of Tarsia Studios, when discussing the release of Little Nightmares 2. Question, is this a direct sequel to the first game, and when does it take place? To which the response is, it is a sequel to the first game. It's in the Little Nightmares timeline, is all I can say about that. Now you want to talk interpretation, let's interpret that. They stated it is a sequel, but then they say it's in the Little Nightmares timeline, rather than saying directly that it follows on from the first game. Now for me this implies that yes it is a sequel in name, Little Nightmares 1, Little Nightmares 2, that is sequential. But in the world and timeline of Little Nightmares, it is in fact not sequential from the first game, as most of you probably know by now. You could say that the two in the title refers to the fact that there are two characters progressing through the game together, rather than one, and does not in any way relate to it being a sequel to the first game. We have to take what clues are provided to us to draw up reasonable conclusions, and to do this we have to follow Six's iconic yellow raincoat. In the opening of Little Nightmares 1, Six is wearing her trademark yellow coat. In Little Nightmares 2, when Mono first meets her, she isn't wearing it until she finds it washed up past the school in the Pale Sea. So how did it get there? Well, we can assume at the very least that it washed up there from the end of Very Little Nightmares when a different girl, wearing the yellow raincoat, fell off of the cliff of the nest, another location where children were being kept prisoner and either turned into dolls or given to the lady at the moor. Now, upon landing in the water, the girl in the yellow raincoat never reappeared from the surface, but the yellow raincoat did. And this ending implies that this other child that helped drop a boulder on the pretender the antagonist of the nest is in fact Six, and it's fair to conclude that once Six made it off of the nest, the raft washed up by the forest and she was subsequently captured by the hunter and kept prisoner 
until Mono crashes through his first TV and makes his way to the woods to save her. Huh? They then use a raft to move on to the Pale City and Six finds her raincoat just after the school area. Now it is in the centre of the room and there is a gap in the roof, leading me to think that the only and more logical explanation is that this is a storage room, potentially for clothes that are left by those viewers who get sucked into TVs and the raincoat was taken by, let's say, another janitor <laughs> and threw from the roof down into the room. That would explain how it got there in my mind, but maybe I'm focusing too much on this because there's a whole host of other clothes that are just left all around the city. In any case, we'll go with that and we'll move on. Six and Mono progress through each location, with Six being captured on more than one occasion and Mono doing his best to save her. After Mono is seen interacting with TVs and trying to reach a door at the end of a strange hallway, we then meet the Thin Man. Who takes Six once more, but leaves a glitched version of Six behind. More on that later. After being chased through buildings and train carts, Mono is then led to the signal tower by glitched Six. Who reappears to show him the way. Mono then meets the Thin Man head on and bag off at the signal tower and we see a bit more of what Mono can actually do, which I think again is further evidence of the connections between Mono and the Thin Man, but we'll get onto that in a little bit too. After seemingly evaporating him and literally pulling the signal tower towards him, or vice versa, to me it looks like he's pulling the signal tower towards him. Mono enters through the hallway he has been seen in those numerous TV sequences in each chapter of the game, though I don't think any of us quite expected to see what was inside. The floating chairs aside, the signal tower is clearly highlighting the not so straightforward aspects of time in this world. The first room we enter we go through a door that takes us back to exactly where we were, but if you are slow you can see Mono's shadow at the other door. And I think that this tower and the puzzles within it symbolises how time, at least in here, is not necessarily linear. Whether this applies to outside the signal tower, that's probably less likely given the more human-like environments and time-sensitive puzzles for elevator switches and stuff like that. After following the music, you look upon the deformed figure of Six, with those same gangly arms that we all remember from our first encounter with an antagonist in the original Little Nightmares, the janitor. The music box seems precious to Six for some reason. It, it also mirrors the first time that Mono saw Six when she was captured by the hunter. So perhaps at least the music box holds some sort of significance to Six. Or maybe it's the only thing keeping her sane at that point in time. Or helps her forget past memories. In any case, at the same time it's keeping her in this state. As we see when we destroy it, Six reverts back to her previous form. Which does open the question, can the rest of these monsters be saved in the same way? <laughs> Do they all have some sort of possession that, that can save them from their eternal torment? Or are they doomed to live this life of feeling nothing but hunger and rage? Classroom etiquette. <laughs> then we are chased by the fleshy embodiment of the eye. That watching eye that we see everywhere. And the signal tower is seemingly where it resides. Watching controlling the monsters that complete its tasks. It then sets about destroying both Six and Mono, which leads us to this literal cliffhanger of a moment. In the form of Six holding onto Mono, that beautifully mirrors one of the new game mechanics of Little Nightmares 2 in which Six and Mono jump further gaps and use the other to help them get across. Only this time, something's different. Mono isn't wearing his brown paper bag to cover his face. He has revealed his face, and Six can see it. There's even a moment where she leans in closer, maybe to get a proper look, and clearly for one reason or another, she does not like what she sees, and she lets him fall to be taken by the eye. And it's not long after that that we learn exactly why Six did that in the first place.
Mono finds a chair, a seat, and sits atop it. And we see him growing older and older and older before finally donning the signature fedora of the Thin Man. Mono was the one in that room at the end of the hallway the entire time. The connections between Mono and the Thin Man were there in plain sight for us to see. We all thought it. The communications with the TVs, the almost reflective powers of the two shown at the entrance to the signal tower, it was there. But what does it really mean? Well, the secret cutscene that you get for collecting all of the glitch children shows us Six's exit out of the signal tower and back into the Pale City, with the glitch Six once again appearing and motioning to something on the floor, specifically an advertising poster for the Moor. And then that familiar hunger sound of Six's stomach growls. Which all but confirms that this game is set before Little Nightmares 1. As most of us I think suspect at this point. I know this video is quite late. Six after being captured for a certain period of time. We don't know how long without food as well as surviving the nest and becoming a deformed monster for a bit, is probably now a bit peckish. So it now makes sense to say that Six willingly entered the moor so she could eat what food is likely there. Yes, we were surviving horrible monsters in Little Nightmares 1 as well, but look at this world. There is no salvation. There is no safe haven. The only way Six can survive at this point is to find some edible food, and where better than a place where the seemingly elite class of this nightmare world go to fill their fat bellies. This also highlights just why Six does not use her newly gained powers from the end of Little Nightmares 1 after munching on the Lady of the Moor, because Six, of course, does not have them yet. Now going back to Glitch Six very quickly, I believe it's fair to say that Glitch 6 and the Shadow 6 that we see in the first game during the hunger scenes are one and the same. Perhaps at the time of making Little Nightmares 1 they didn't know that they were necessarily going to use TVs and that particular design and the Glitch children and stuff like that which would potentially justify why they look different but I think are meant to represent the same thing. Glitch 6 looks similar to the other children but was actively interacting with Mono by helping him reach the signal tower and meeting with the thin man and also of course in the secret ending cutscene where she points six towards the flyer of the moor now the glitch six clearly holds a level of understanding of the world and the timing of these events that our six currently does not have and for some reason wants our six to go to the moor now my guess is, and this will link in with the time loop theory and other timelines that we'll get onto in a moment, but is that Glitch 6 and the other Glitch children, and maybe the Thin Man himself, all come from another timeline of events through the TVs for one reason or another. They were even taken there, or they came through there themselves at different points in time. Now with that in mind, let's go back and reassess the connections between Mono and the Thin Man, as this is what is seemingly has created another popular theory for the game's timeline. The ending to Little Nightmares 2 certainly gave us more questions than answers, and a lot of theories as to what this meant. Six letting go of Mono, and then Mono growing up within the signal tower and becoming the Thin Man, leads many of us to see the entire Little Nightmares series as an infinite time loop that runs over and over. Now I've been racking my brain over this and trying to see why it works, not necessarily if it works. But before we do that however, let's define a time loop. And checking good old Wikipedia, it states that time loops are repeating periods of time that are constantly resetting when a certain condition is met, and once this condition is met, the loop then resets to its designated start point. 
Now when it comes to Six and Mono, and more specifically, Mono becoming the Thin Man, I believe this situation fits the causal loop theory more. This is when, whether by means of retrocausality or time travel, in this case retrocausality, which is a concept of cause and effect in which one effect precedes its cause in time, and so a later event affects an earlier one. Bear with me on this. With this in mind, let's apply it to Six and Mono's situation. For Mono to be the Thin Man, which is what is heavily implied, if not flat out fact at this point, Six has to let him go at the end of the game, creating the causal loop paradox that they are in, as the Thin Man already existed in this timeline. Now the effect that precedes its cause in time is the Thin Man, and this is important as the Thin Man should not already exist, as Mono has not grown up in the Signal Tower to become him. However, we also need to take account of the fact that if this time loop affects Six, then it has further ramifications for the other games in the series. The loop can't just reset within the timeline of just Little Nightmares 2, from Mono crashing out of the first TV to him becoming the Thin Man, as where does that leave Six? Six leaves the Signal Tower and goes to the Moor, starting the events of Little Nightmares 1. So that would suggest that because Mono is the Thin Man and is connected to the Signal Tower, only Mono relives the time paradox and the events in Little Nightmares 2, and Six only lives through them once? Again, another question to ponder which is very difficult for me to take. Let's go back to why. It could just be a quite literal looping of time, and time in this world resets to those particular points. Mono crashes through the TV, resetting the time loop from Little Nightmares 2. But why does this time loop exist? There has to be a reason that the Thin Man is chasing Mono and Six throughout Little Nightmares 2, and why he captures Six and turns her into a monster, assuming he is the one that did that. Well, let's take a look at the website description of the Thin Man and try and glean something from that. As the ever-present hum of the transmission chokes the airways, the Thin Man continues his endless journey through this desolate place, haunting the shadows, searching for something. Now, there's a few key words that help back up the time loop theory here. His endless journey, as in endless through time, and the other key part is that he's searching for something. What I think he is searching for is a way to break this cycle that has been created by someone else, or some otherworldly force, and we'll come onto that in the next section of the video. What else is he searching for when the only scenes we see of him reflect that of Mono's abilities during the game? Why would he go to the effort to capture Six as the Thin Man? Because he knows that Six is going to drop his ass out of the sky as Mono? Surprise, mother! The Thin Man has those memories, but Mono does not, as it hasn't happened to that Mono yet. But perhaps, and as we mentioned previously when talking about Glitch 6, perhaps in an alternate reality or timeline that exists because of this time loop, as we talked about previously with Glitch 6, it has happened to the Thin Man, and maybe it has happened to Glitch 6. We could go as far as to say that they are from a separate reality of time and space, the same with the rest of the Glitch children, lost in time and space, just a shadow in this world. And if we go with that theory, then that opens up another huge question. If the Thin Man is not responsible for creating the time loop in the first place, because he seemingly wants to break that cycle, and is a victim of it, then who is? Starting this section off, I'll be totally honest, I had never heard of Lovecraftian horror. It wasn't until I had a comment on my Little Nightmares 2 video that mentioned it, which then made me go through and find out more about Lovecraftian horror and how you can see the inspiration of it surrounding the world of Little Nightmares. I believe that this can also help support our understanding of Little Nightmares, or at least a theory of it. But first, let me briefly explain just what Lovecraftian horror actually is. Lovecraftian horror is a subgenre of horror fiction that emphasizes the cosmic horror of the unknown, 
or the unknowable. More than gore or other elements of shock. It is named after American author H.P. Lovecraft, who died in 1937. His work emphasizes a philosophy of cosmicism, the idea that the reality underlying the veneer of normality is so alien that seeing it would be harmful. We see the world as it is and we all have certain beliefs, however Lovecraftian horror challenges the notion that we have any understanding as to what is really going on in the universe. And this is because were we to find out, our brains could not comprehend the things we would be seeing. And now take Fran Bow and the pills she takes as an example of this. She walks through what we would consider to be the normal world that we all know and understand to some extent or another. Then Fran takes her special duotine pills and is shown other realities that are layered on top of her own. Now start thinking about if those realities and trillions of others were layered on top of ours in the same way, except that we can't see them. We are blue pilled if you like, and once you see the truth, the red pill, there is no unseeing it, and it would most likely send you mad at the thought. Now take these other realities and add Lovecraftian creatures like Cthulhu, the most infamous of H.P. Lovecraft's creations, into the mix. There's no way our brains could process what is happening in that kind of scenario. But how does all this relate to Little Nightmares? Well for starters let's discuss what the devs actually said when describing the monsters in Little Nightmares 2. All of the residents of Little Nightmares, they don't really have motivations. It's like ideas, the base instinct of people. So we take this base instinct and pull it in different directions. So the hunter is just bloodthirsty. He has the blood sport impulse, I guess. Just reducing people and animals to nothing or trophies on the wall. Just pure, naked aggression. They don't have a goal in life that they want to achieve. It's just this urge. Teachers can be terrifying, this sense of authority that people have over you as a child. Teachers are wonderful as well, but this one isn't. This tells us that these creatures carrying out these acts and tasks have no emotion, no thoughts, just urges and an innate desire that's been set upon them. Have you ever stopped and wondered why it's only children that are chased around by these terrible monsters in this world? Well this is where I think the Little Nightmares comic series comes into focus. Only two issues were completed and issues 3 and 4 were cancelled, but I do hope we get to see more stories like this, and maybe we'll get more similar to the Little Nightmares 2 comics which were shorter and focused on four individuals who we may well see in future DLC. Now to start this bit off, there's no confirmation that these are canon, as far as I know, so take for that what you will. But in a game series where so much is left open to interpretation, I think to take elements from the comics to help build a picture for understanding the game is something that at least I'm okay with. So if you will indulge me once more, let's crack on. The comic I want to focus on here is titled The Tale of the North Wind. It is a story told to Six by another child in the moor. He explains that he came from a village with his sister and left as the north wind came through, destroying everything in its search for children. The brother and sister hid in a barn for refuge. Unfortunately, the north wind finds them and after the boy tried to protect his sister from harm, the north wind showed him the truth. And the truth was that his sister was, in fact, either dead or part of the north wind's wrath the entire time and the hand that he thought he'd been holding that was his sister's was in fact the ferryman's hand. For those of you that don't know, the ferryman finds and brings children to the moor. Not much else is known about him as well as if he brings children to the moor to help them, for example getting food and surviving, or if he's being controlled by another and brings them there to die. But if we break down some of the phrases and speech used in this comic, it starts to paint a picture of the real reality of Little Nightmares. The two children survived, but the North Wind gave them no rest, and after what happened to their village, they were of course welcomed by everyone. This aptly showing that the North Wind didn't just destroy the village, but turned its adult inhabitants into monsters, or at least controls them to go and attack all the children, likely as previously mentioned stripping them away to their base urges. 
The boy asks the North Wind to leave them be as it approached the barn that they hid in, to which the North Wind replied, Leave you be? Where's the fun in that? To say nothing of the wager I'd lose, even though my adversary is a bit of a cheat. This right here I think says so much about why this world is the way that it is. The adults are turned into monsters by the North Wind and each are tasked with different activities to undertake, or as previously mentioned, are driven by horrible urges based on their former lives and professions, hence why the names of a lot of the bosses are the jobs that they either had or they now complete as tasks. But anyway, so it seems to me that it plays out something like this. Okay, so originally when I wrote this, I had my sort of theory in my head and then I saw this on Twitter and then it made me think that this was not actually the case purely based on this tweet from the at Little Knights Twitter account. That's also some really cool cosplay by the way. But I will talk about it anyway. The North Wind, this otherworldly Lovecraftian like entity wanted to be able to interact with the human world. So it made a deal with the devil and why why do i say the devil and this is starting to sound very out of the way i know but i'm i'm gonna carry on it is very much a stretch but it's purely based on that quote there where it says even though my adversary is a bit of a cheat and the devil is of course well known in regards of mischief and cheating unless there's something else that would fit that uh sort of profile a bit better i would like to think it's safe to assume that at least in this comic who the North Wind is referring to is the devil and that they placed a wager together. The devil giving the North Wind his opportunity to move into the human world from its previous one and to do as he pleases and whether this was post world war ii i think has, has been speculated or not i'm not too sure based on like clothing and stuff like that but more importantly the devil afforded the children of the world a little bit of protection from the north wind and that protection that it afforded them was darkness and we see this from the earlier pages where one of the children says to six sometimes the light doesn't help at all because in the light you see things and of course, they see you. Children can never outrun the North Wind and the creatures it has created. All they can do is hide in the darkness. And the North Wind has eyes everywhere to try and catch them. It also controls these monsters, each with their own urges, but with one desire above all else. Find the children. Find them any way they can. Even if you have to trap them, in a time loop that forever tortures them through death and horror and nightmarish situations that they barely survive. And you see where I'm starting to go with this outlandish theory. For the North Wind to try and catch the last few remaining children, it created this time loop through Mono, perhaps as he saw what strength and courage as well as powers he had, so that he could, for one thing, make Mono another one of his monsters, and two, to catch a potentially dangerous child that was seemingly causing havoc and eluding its other subordinates in the nest. Perhaps it knew what Six would become after its encounter with the Lady of the Moor, something that could challenge this nightmarish world that the North Wind had created, someone who could fight back and ruin its little game of nightmares for these poor lonely children. Now the comic portrays this North Wind like a puppet master. The children and the rest of the world are toys being played with by these otherworldly beings that far outmatch anything humankind has to offer against it. That is exactly what Lovecraftian horror is about. It's the idea that we are not the top of the food chain and we are small, insignificant and alone. We just don't know it yet. 
does that not in itself encapsulate everything about Little Nightmares and the themes of loneliness and escapism in the game? Now, as I mentioned previously, with all that said, and with this this section being a very late addition to the script for this video, I don't think I would be doing you guys justice for exploring as many theories as possible, which leads me back to the tweet that I showed you earlier. The At Little Knights Twitter feed. I saw this pop up not too long ago, and it essentially threw everything I said out the window, depending on how much you apply it. Are you sure you are living in the real world, little ones? But this now, massively sort of implies if not kind of confirms that the the world of little nightmares and the world in which we play is not the normal reality which would debunk everything that i just explained previously maybe the children of the real world were brought to this nightmarish one that has been ravished by the north wind though at this point i feel like i've gone down too deep into the lovecraftian rabbit hole which then leads me to go back all the way back to the simplest and most obvious answer, which according to Occam's Razor's principle, makes it the correct one. This is a nightmare, a literal nightmare, being dreamt up by a child who has horrible experiences with his teacher, taking frequent trips to the doctors, weird creepy looks or maybe even more from the janitor of his school, his potentially abusive mother, maybe. We're never likely to find this out, obviously. However, as I have discussed at length, this game is purposely left open to your interpretation of events. I have taken slices from all different kinds of pizzas and put this together in one rather gargantuan video that I really should have cut down. But hey, I'm thorough if nothing else. So why don't we wrap this thing up? Whether this is indeed just a nightmare that someone in the real world, as in our world, is having, or indeed the North Wind brought children to its own reality as part of a crazy deal with the devil, or just a never-ending time loop for Mono, the game does a perfect job of making you, or at least me, question everything about it. Initially I was very much looking at the series thematically, you know? It's a looping nightmare that Six and Mono are experiencing, and they have to go through it over and over. But even then there has to be something that is controlling that situation and that time loop. And I don't feel like it would be the Thin Man. And as the ending showed us, the eyes, the fleshy embodiment of, I guess, the North Wind is what is really pulling the strings and sets up Mono in his role as the Thin Man. But Little Nightmares is not a straightforward game to try and understand. Like many horror franchises, it sprinkles lore and secrets within its gameplay, its comics and its story, whilst leaving out obvious answers as to why things are the way they are. And for a game like this, it makes perfect sense to do so. The game is called Little Nightmares. These children are experiencing the manifestations of horrific creatures that are fed from our normal everyday lives. Like scary classroom teachers, going to the doctors, even bullies from your childhood. They take these bad memories that I'm sure a lot of us have experienced in our youth, to a certain extent, and turned it into the worst kind of nightmare fuel. Thank you to anyone that actually stayed and watched the entirety of this video. It was genuinely, easily, the longest discussion video that I've done on the channel. And also, I'm, you know, I'm not crazy by saying about just how many theories I essentially talked about that at one point during the making of this video I thought might be a right answer, although we will never know, and then quickly debunked that by finding something else, even a tweet or something else that kind of debunks that. But I, like I said before, I don't think I'd be doing the video justice if I'd left the video and left other information that I knew out of the video. So if there's stuff that I didn't know, that's fair enough, but I don't like to leave 
out specific bits of information to make my point, if that makes sense. I want a holistic picture of, uh, of what we're trying to understand here, and I hope you guys understood that. I know the video was a bit sort of back and forth, um, and I must admit I'm a bit nervous to post this video because it's a bigger game than some of the others that we've talked about here, so, um, so no hate for <laughs> anyone new who's found the channel. I love you all. If you did like the video, please do hit that like button and uh, and share it if you, if you like it and and let me let me know your theories and what you actually think is going on in Little Nightmares too. Hit me up with some stuff that I didn't talk about, despite how long this freaking video is. Uh, consider subscribing and checking out some of my other understanding the game videos. You know we've covered stuff like Frambo, Little Misfortune, the Faith series, and Sally Face. So if you like any of those go and check them out. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.